Okay. Looks like we are on. So, welcome to Bible study, everybody. Uh, I'm going to start off with a few announcements just while we're waiting for our Facebook friends to join us. Um, it's a little bit early, but our Advent devotional books are in. So, sorry, my volume was turned down. Please silence your cell phone. Thank you. It was your voice. I know. Yeah, that's why I don't like it. Anyway, our Advent devotions did get delivered. So if you are interested in going through this devotional with us, it starts on November 28th. That's the first Sunday of Advent, and it'll carry us through Christmas. Um, we're not going to be doing every single devotional together, but in all of our different meetings, we'll be touching on the Advent devotions through the season. And of course, um, on Sundays, the, there's a Sunday devotion that goes with the different Advent things, you know, hope, joy, peace, love. And we'll be talking about that in the services, too. So. Um, they are on the table in the Welcome Center. Um, they are free. If you'd like to make a donation to cover the cost of the book, they cost us about $7 each. So if you'd like to donate money to cover that, you can, but we want to make sure everybody has one. So if you don't have the money for it, that's okay. We want you to have one. The one thing I ask is that if you are interested, uh, grab one now because we're going through them a little faster than we expected, and we might need to order more. So if we do, we want to know sooner. We don't want it to be, you know, halfway through December right now. So um, I think the teens might actually be doing some of this too. Spoilers, but um, these are this it, this year's is called Come Peasant King, and these are um, produced through the denomination. So. Um, you can buy them on your own if you want, but they're about twice as much okay. if you buy them. Which is better. So, I mean, if you want to buy them on Amazon, you can, but we got we get them on a discount because we're buying them through the church. So, um, hello, Venus. Glad you could join us. I don't know what. Why does Venus have a five next to her name? Because Facebook put these like anniversaries. So like oh, they're all ranked? Well, Darlene's number one. You're number one. You're number one. Woo. Okay, I don't know what that means. I think it's the number of years. Oh. They used to say anniversary member or something, and now it's got numbers. They change it every week, Darlene. Like Once you figure it out, they change it. Yeah. I didn't hear more than one year. That's a follower for five years. So. Darlene has been a follower for one year. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Okay, well, before I get angry at the computer box again, a couple other announcements. Um, for those of you who donated to Crisis Care Kits, we were able to deliver um, three cases, yeah, three cases of kits this past weekend, and they were, they're going to Fawn Grove. Um, so thank you very much everybody who donated for that. Um, we are currently doing um, a Thanksgiving food drive, so if you'd like to make a donation to our pantry uh, for Thanksgiving related foods, you can drop them up in the brown box out in the foyer. If you'd like to make a donation to the Sunday Breakfast Mission over in Delaware, we have paper bags on the Welcome Center that have the Breakfast Mission logo. So that way you know if you want it to go to one place specifically or the other place specifically, you can choose how those donations go. Uh, the, the Breakfast Mission is also still collecting warm clothing. So Reminder of Food pantry is next Saturday instead of the fourth Saturday? Correct. So normally food pantry is on the fourth Saturday of every month, but for November and December it gets bumped up a week yeah. so that we hold it before the holiday. So it's going to be on November 20th this this um, month. So not, not a couple days from now, but a week and a couple days from now, if you're watching this live. So Saturday, November 20th from 8.30 to 11 a.m. here at the church. Um, we have food. There's no requirements. Um, you can pick up food for you. You can pick up food for a friend or neighbor. Uh, we want to give everybody food. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Warm clothes. I was going there. The breakfast mission is still collecting hats, scarves, coats, gloves, those kinds of things. Um, several of you guys have donated coats. Thank you very much. Um, they are collecting for adults and children. So if you've got a coat in your closet you don't wear anymore, if you see something on sale you want to pick up at Walmart, um, all of the above, new, used, whatever, they just ask that they're clean. And uh, we can collect them and send them over. So you don't even have to run over to drop them off. 
Uh, this Saturday, the 13th, we are doing a cleanup here at the church. Yep. So, yeah, we're going to be uh, putting away some of our Bible school decorations. We're going to be uh, doing some cleaning and painting inside. Um, James is going to go up on the roof and clean the gutters. Hopefully he doesn't fall. But we've got some bushes, so I think we're okay there. <laughs> he's pretty uh, in the bushes. Yeah. Um, he's sure to be <laughs> no, we really have bushes. They're right there. <laughs> so, um, we have jobs inside, outside, all different kinds of things. Um, we're going to meet here at 8.30, and we'll probably finish up around noon. So anybody who would like to come out and help, uh, I know, Jim, you have an excuse. So, <laughs> um, but uh, that's going to be this Saturday. Uh, and uh, Yes, I think I mentioned that. Did you say that? Mm-hmm. Oh, how did I mention that? Mm. Sorry. <laughs> there's, there's like seven comments or anything. Right um, so yeah, so those are all of our announcements, I believe. We don't have any more birthdays this week. Um, oh, the last thing. So the breakfast mission, for, for their Thanksgiving food drive, they're going to be doing their distributions on Monday, November 22nd and Tuesday, November 23rd, from 8 in the morning to 5 p.m. So if you are not able to donate food, but you're able to donate time, uh, they can use some volunteers, especially if you or if you know someone who speaks Spanish, they can use some more Spanish-speaking volunteers. So if you uh, have any questions about that, um, you can call the Breakfast Mission and ask for Bruce Davison. Bruce is the one who's coordinating this. Well, of course, if you happen to run into them in church, you can always talk to Pastor Tom. So, um, the last thing I wanted to mention was about Bible school. We did finish up Knights of the North Castle this past Sunday night, but we are still having our kids' programs every Sunday night. Just because that theme is done, we are still holding all of our services. So, Sunday nights, 6 p.m., we're going to have our adult Bible study here in the sanctuary. Uh, the teens are going to be having youth group down in the youth room, and then the kids are going to be having classes down at the end of the hallway in the classroom in the gym. So we're going to have classes for all different ages, little kids all the way to grown-ups, and we want everybody to come out. So anybody who's been coming for Bible school, keep coming. And uh, if you want to invite more people, we'd love to have more people. Good? Um, our kids are going to be doing a Christmas program this year. So if uh, that's something your little guys might be interested in, we're going to start doing parts for that in a week or two. Um, we're going to do, it's going to be called Tell the Story, right? And all the, kid, the kids are going to get to dress up as the different characters in the story cool. and get to read some of the Bible story, the scripture, telling the story of Christmas. And uh, we do have an adult-sized donkey costume. <laughs> and I don't know that we've decided for sure who gets to be the donkey this year. Uh, two years ago, it was Megan Ty. This during Bible school, Daryl got to be the donkey. So I don't know who gets to be the donkey next. Hey, James, it's time. It's it's a well. He'd be a little donkey. I don't know. <laughs> it's a pretty tall costume. Oh. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah, he's pretty tall. Oh. <laughs> you well. Okay. You don't have to be the donkey. You want to be like a king and be a wise man. Like a shepherd, shepherds shepherd. get sticks. Always the shepherd. You can't hit your brothers. That's you should be a shepherd, and we should make your brother sheep. Ah, uh, that would be cute. It One would probably year, end badly though. When he was little, <laughs> I was little Bo Peep, and I got a sheep costume. <laughs> <laughs> nice, <Yeah>. nice. So. <laughs> Um, I don't know if we're going to have a live baby Jesus or not this year. Why? I don't know about that. Yeah. I think, I think it should be. I think Josiah should be baby Jesus. <laughs> I think you should be baby Jesus, and I'll be Mary, and I can carry you down. Or, or you know, look, there no. are twins. That's two, true. We could have two babies. We could be like a Hollywood no. thing and swap the twins. <laughs> in yeah. We have like Jesus. But they're just they like Levi could be John the Baptist, and one of the twins could be Jesus. Uh, we're gonna workshop this. Right? I like it. Did John the Baptist have light-up sneakers? I bet he did. Okay. So I don't know if you know, but I'm excited. I'm very excited about a kids' Christmas program. You know, last year because of everything that was going on with COVID, 
we had the puppet show, but the kids didn't actually get to do the program. So uh, we're very excited that the kids are going to be doing the program. Yes, sir. Maybe you should be the donkey. Maybe I should be the donkey? What are you trying to say? Nothing, just say it. That, I, that I'm majestic? That's, that's, a very special, yes. that's a very special position. That that's is. true. There, that listen, is. there's a very important talking donkey in the Bible. Oh, yeah, well, there is, yep. And that's the old joke, right? If, if God can talk through a donkey, he can also use a pastor. Who was writing the book, Dan? I'll find a story for him to read it. Well, that's Easter. I don't think anybody gets to ride the donkey at Christmas. No, there was another talking donkey. Oh, you're, that's Balaam. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The donkey ran him into a wall, and he was going to get up and kick the donkey, and the donkey's like, dude, there's an angel right there trying to kill you. Exactly. I mean, that's the message, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. So those are all the announcements, and like I said, I'm very excited about Christmas. Um, we are also having a fellowship event for Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving Eve, so we have our normal Wednesday night service like we are tonight. We will be meeting for prayer and worship on Thanksgiving Eve, and we're going to be having a time of fellowship afterwards with uh, cookies and cider and hot chocolate. What is cider? Uh, expensive apple juice. Apple oh. juice. Yes. <laughs> Right? Am I wrong? No, it's a little different than no. yeah. It's liquid <laughs> apple. Yes. <laughs> it's Is that better? It's just cloudy and so strange. You know what? I want you to give me a cup of apple butter then. No, it's spicy apple juice. So, apple those butter. are all of our announcements. We do have people online. Um, we have Jane and Venus, and of course, Jill and Darlene are poking in on there, but they're here too. Um, We've got somebody else on there. I don't know who it is. But whoever's on there, you can say hello in the comments. We do have a prayer request that came in on Facebook here. Um, Edgar is having surgery on his finger on Friday. He has like a cyst on his knuckle. Mm. And it's real big and he's having trouble. So, what? so let's all pray not just that the surgery goes well, but that Edgar listens to the doctor and doesn't use his and for a couple days. Okay. So we've already told him he's not allowed to do anything at the work day. But he probably will try. So, mm -hmm. um, Thank you, Jane, for sharing that. A couple other prayer requests that have come in. Um, well, one is Veterans Day is tomorrow. I know different people observe it on different days because it's in the middle of the week. But just for this week's theme, let's remember to pray for our veterans. Um, we are very blessed in our country to have many freedoms, and we would not have those freedoms without our veterans. Amen. Thank Amen. You. And uh, maybe, and even like me, even separate from the fighting part of it, um, I was able to get my vaccine because some National Guard people were there volunteering. Some young men and women were helping. So uh, they helped with natural disasters and all kinds of other stuff too. So. We're very thankful for people who are willing to serve and volunteer and help others who have a need. So we thank you for that. Um, we want to remember, uh, Carol has a prayer request here for her friend Sandra, who's going through some health issues right now. So we want to continue to pray for her as well. We to pray for our brother Jim, who's got heart surgery coming up. And uh, we're going to take a moment, when we get to our prayer time, we are going to do some anointing. So I, I've already talked to Jim. He would like to be anointed for his prayer. If anyone else would like to have an anointing while we're doing that, just let me know. We can do that. Um, of course, I can't do that online, but if you'd like us to do a special prayer for you um, with anointing, something we do often do in the church is sometimes a person can be anointed in the place of someone else, just as an intercessory prayer. So if any of our friends on Facebook feel like that's something you'd want, you can let us know in the comments. Um, Venus is asking prayers for her body, for her health. So Venus, we will continue praying for you, sister. She's been on a journey the last few months. And we want to keep Where, where we are, the tissues. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So before we get to a prayer time, I want to share a couple of prayer requests that came in from the prayer mobilization line as well. Some prayer requests from around the world. And that will also give our Facebook friends time to post anything else they'd like to post. 
Um, there is a brief scripture reading I'd like to share here to introduce our prayer time. It's from Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. We actually shared this not too long ago on a Sunday morning as our call to worship. This is one of those psalms of ascent. Uh, these are psalms that would be sung by the people as they were traveling into Jerusalem to celebrate festivals. And, and uh, a festival like the Passover where they would all go to Jerusalem. And so you'd be marching into the city and you'd be able to see from far away, even though the area is kind of flat because it's near a river, uh, the temple is up on a, well, they call it the Temple Mount. It's not quite a mountain if you live in the Rockies, but for Israel it's a mountain. Um, so you'd see the mount, the Temple Mount and the Temple rising up. So the reason I say this is because we mentioned the hill on the mountain here. So I'd like to read verses 1 and 2. I lift my eyes to the mountains or to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So in the, the prayer here, they mention that um, prayer, and I, and I like this line, the same way when you're walking to Jerusalem, you would see the Temple Mount rising up. Um, they say that prayer gives us that kind of perspective, that let me get this right. Prayer allows us to look over the horizon of what is visible to the grandeur of the things of God. So the same way a mountain rises up and you can see it over the horizon as you're traveling before you can see anything else around it. The same prayer does that for us. It lets us see ahead or see further and see the promises of God. Um, and in this case specifically, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen that God has promised to help us, to listen to us. Um, now, as far as the prayer mobilization line, there are a few things that they want us to lift up. Um, there are two countries we're going to pray for tonight. One is Singapore, and one is Timor-Leste, or uh, some people would say East Timor, if you were doing it in, uh, in you know, some countries. We pronounce the country in, a, in the language of the... The, the native people. So for instance, like we we might call the Ivory Coast Cote d'Ivoire. Or Sierra Leone, we don't call like Lion Hill, we call it Sierra Leone. So Timor Leste means East Timor. Um, I didn't know that, but I wanted to share that because I learned it today. Um, in Singapore, the Church of the Nazarene began their work in 2017. There is one organized church with 13 members. And the Church of Nazarene began their work in Timor Leste in 2001. There is one organized church and three not yet organized churches with 91 members. Both of these countries are on the Asia Pacific region. So, uh, beginning with Singapore, uh, Singapore's history goes back um, as a city into the 14th century, and it began as a Malay trading port known as Temasek. In the 17th century, the city was burned and was completely destroyed, but in 1819, uh, the, the British Empire established a new trading colony on the same site, and it grew to the point of becoming an independent country in 1963, and it has become one of the most prosperous countries in the world today. Buddhism is the major religion in Singapore, about 31%, with Christianity and Islam growing in significance. Timor Leste also dates back to about the 14th century, uh, but it came under Portuguese rule starting in 1511 and was under Portuguese rule until 1974. After that, there was a civil war, uh, an Indonesian invasion, and there have been many political, social, and natural disasters, which has left up to 75% of the country's infrastructure and economy destroyed and were not functioning. Uh, Timor Leste achieved their independence in 2002, but their restoration and recovery is very much still in progress. Um, Christianity is the major religion on the island, 99%. Um, and one of the interesting things to pray for here is Singapore right now has one of the lowest fertility rates in the world, with less than 28% of the population under 25. Wow. 
Um, whereas in Timor-Leste Day, 60% of the population is under 25. So uh, they don't really speak as to why that's the case, but that is certainly something to pray for, a very low birth rate. Um, the official languages of Singapore are English and Mandarin. In Timor-Leste, Portuguese is the official language with um, a language known as Titum that has many vocal dialects. The literacy rate in Singapore is 97.3%, which is very high. In Timor-Leste, the literacy rate is about 68%. Um, Singapore has an unemployment rate of about 2%, so there's little or no poverty in Singapore. Hmm. Um, Timor-Leste um, has an unemployment rate of about 5%, but about 42% of the population live under the poverty line. So even though they have a relatively low unemployment rate, they still have a high level of poverty in Timor Leste. Um, many of the challenges both of these areas are facing right now are due to COVID and COVID restrictions. Like many places around the world, uh, people are not allowed to meet in large church gatherings and they, um, particularly in Singapore, are still facing those restrictions. So people are not able to gather together. Um, in Singapore, they've had these restrictions for about 20 months now, almost two years. So it's been a very difficult time for the church. I know we went through that as well, thankfully not as long. But uh, please, keep, please keep praying. Um, got a couple more hellos on Facebook. Our friend Jim Farinaccio is online. Hello, Jim. Good to see you, brother. And Trudy is online as well. Hello, Trudy. Some of the praises they would like to share. One is for the House of Bread Church of the Nazarene in Singapore. They uh, are they they say it is a strong group of Christ followers made up of mostly young families, and they praise God for life changing transformations and new family legacies. It's a good way to put it. New family legacies. Um, we thank God for one member of the church who's begun the course of study for Nazarene ministers. They have another praise for opportunities they've had to develop relationships and minister to foreign workers who have been greatly impacted by these restrictions. So you have people in Singapore ministering to people who are foreign workers in Singapore. Um, Timor Leste um, is able to worship in person again, and their churches are starting to grow and recover from that time, so they praise God for that. Uh, the COVID-19 rates in Timor Leste have dropped significantly due to vaccination efforts, and they praise God that they've been able to have those vaccines. Some prayer requests from these areas. Uh, one is pray that a children's ministry can be developed while preserving uh, the welcoming atmosphere that's been cultivated through meeting in homes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they've been meeting in people's homes for the last two years, and as they transition, that's a different kind of thing, especially for the little ones. Um, due to restrictions on group meetings, the House of Bread Church, the one we mentioned earlier, um, is following a hybrid model of meeting. Each week, um, there is online worship and study of God's Word, but in-person worship and times of in-person fellowship are greatly missed, and they are praying that those restrictions would be lifted soon. Uh, pray that members would take advantage of every opportunity to deepen relationships, to be salt and light, and to have deeper conversations regarding faith issues. I think that's a beautiful prayer for us as well. Yeah. Um, pray for the start of other ministries and for the training that needs to take place for the leaders in this area. All right, I don't see any new prayer requests, so we're going to go into our prayer time right now. Um, I'm going to pray for these requests here, and then once I get through these requests, I'll come over and we'll pray specifically for you, Jim. And we'll, we'll do an anointing. Is there anyone else who would like to be anointed tonight as we pray? No pressure here, just an invitation. That's So, um, in the book of James, it's something that we're told to do when we pray, where we put some oil on someone's head. In, in, in the Bible times, putting oil on your head was a sign of blessing. So, um, kind of like you might put conditioner on your hair and lotion in your skin. Um, Putting oil on your head was a sign of blessing and abundance and care. And so a, a habit was made that we put a little bit of oil on someone's head when we pray for something significant. Um, sometimes it's for a health concern. So for, for Mr. Isaac, he's going to have heart surgery. So that's why we're going to be anointing him. 
but people get anointed for different kinds of reasons as well. Sometimes they're going through a personal trial. Sometimes they're celebrating, and they want to do it as an act of praise. Some people might even be anointed in place of someone else. So those are all different reasons you could be anointed, but you don't have to be anointed with oil. Just kind of something extra we do. Just like you don't have to go to the altar to pray, but it's something that we do sometimes to help us focus and kind of bring our attention and our heart all together. Yeah. 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 Does that make sense? Sure. So would anyone like to be anointed or no? It's okay. No. Would you rather? Sure. Okay. Um, we can anoint you for your personal prayer request. So um, uh, we'll come over and we'll pray for Jim. I'll anoint him. And then after that, we'll come over to you and anoint you. If you'd like us to anoint you in your seat where you are, we can do that. If you'd like to come up to the altar, you, you're welcome to do that as well, too, whatever you prefer. So when we get there, wherever you're at, I'll come to you. Okay? And Ms. Darlene, since you're with your grandson, if you'd like to pray part of that prayer, I'd invite you to do that too when we get there. Okay? All right, well, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this chance to be together tonight. Thank you for everything that you've done for us and everything that you've promised to us. Father, thank you for Psalm 121 and the promise that our help comes from you. Father, I pray that we would hold that promise in our hearts, and like they say in the devotion, that we would see your truth on the horizon, that we would see your promise, that we would see your action in the world, and we would see our hope come to fruition to give us a word of testimony, Father. Um, we lift up our brothers and sisters in Singapore and in Timor Leste. Father, we thank you for being with them through this difficult season. We pray that uh, the situation in Singapore would improve so that they would be able to gather together again. We pray for those in Timor Leste and the significant economic and political issues that they have been having, the recovery that is necessary there. Father, we praise you for the work that you're doing in those countries, and of course we praise you for the work that you're doing here. We thank you for an incredible season of Bible school. Father, thank you that even though it was different, that you opened doors. and. We, uh, we don't take it lightly, Father, when you trust us with children. So thank you very much, Father, for trusting us with some little ones. And thank you for the opportunity to share your word with them and to worship with them. It is a blessing. And Father, I pray that you would continue to be with us as a church as we invest in our community outreach and our children's outreach on Sunday night. Father, we pray that you would lead us and that we would follow you to only do what you call us to do. Not to follow our own way, Father, but to follow yours. <coughs> we lift up our brothers and sisters who are veterans this week, Father. Um, of course, we try to remember them every day, but we remember those who volunteer to risk their lives, to give up their own comfort and safety in order to help others. And uh, we thank you, Father, that there are so many. We know that your word tells us that the greatest expression of love is to lay down your life for another. And we thank you for those who are willing to risk that in order to care. Um, Father, we lift up Sandra to you with uh, the situation that she's dealing with. Um, we, we lift up some ongoing issues that she's waiting for information on, Father. And we pray that you would be with her during this time of waiting. We pray that uh, she would get good news from the doctor and that through all of this, you would bring her to a place of healing and peace. That uh, whatever happens, that she would know in her heart that you are with her, that you are present with her. Mm -hmm. Father, we lift up this special request for a young woman named Jackie that Darlene ran into. We thank you for making that connection, for opening that door. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, Father, we don't know her or her story. We just know that she needs prayer. So Father, we pray that you would step into her life and that <clears throat> That she would feel your love. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel led to pray for her, Father. That she would know that she is loved. That you are opening the door to grace and forgiveness. And that you are there for her, Father. We pray that this young woman would know you. Um, we lift up our unspoken prayer requests, Father. And we know there are many. 
We lift up our brother Edgar as he's preparing for surgery on Friday. We pray that there would be no complications and that um, he would get back to having his hand working well again. We lift up our sister Venus and the health struggles that she has been having. Father, please uh, help her to get the answer she's been waiting for, and please help her with the symptoms that she is struggling with. We lift up our brother Mark from the mission as he uh, had his surgery postponed, Father, and we pray that uh, when that happens in a couple of weeks that you would be present with him. And of course, right now, Father, we lift up our brother Jim to you um, as he is preparing to have the surgery. We know that over these last couple of years, you have brought him through some significant health hurdles, Father, and we thank you for that. We praise your name that you've been with him through his open heart surgery. And Father, we pray that as he is preparing for this valve replacement, that you would be present with he and Carol, that you would give them peace as they are waiting for this to happen. Father, we pray for the staff. We pray for the doctors and the nurses. We pray that they would have wisdom and skill. We pray that all the, the technical aspects would go off without a hitch. Father, we pray that this valve replacement would restore the function that Jim needs. We pray that it would restore his ability to move around and to breathe. Father, we pray for a complete recovery. Amen. And Father, Amen. we just thank you for the opportunity to have this medical care. At the same time, we know that you are the great physician. And so Father, right now, as we are commanded in your word, we anoint Jim in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Brother, know that you are loved that you have a great physician who cares about you, who sent his son to save you, and that no matter what happens, you are in the palm of his hand, in the center of his will. I pray that God would touch your heart physically and spiritually, that you would know his shalom as you wait for this procedure, and that you would wake, wake up from it restored. Mm -hmm. Father, we also pray for our sister Carol. We pray that you would give her peace as she waits for Jim to come through this procedure, as she has to wait in the waiting room. Father, we pray that that would be as short as possible, and the news would be celebratory. Amen. 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 Father, we also lift up our brother Xavier to you. Father, you know what's going on in his heart and his life. He is seeking you, and Father, he needs you. So, Father, as we said, we anoint you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Know that you are loved, Father, that you are not alone, that the situations that you are facing while they might seem difficult or not be difficult for God, mm -hmm. that he is here with you, that no matter what you face, you are never alone. You have a God who loves you. You have his Holy Spirit in your heart. You have a church family who loves you. Of course, you have a grandmother here who loves you as well. Would you like to pray for yeah. Father God, I, just, I lift up this child. Father, I pray that you would touch him and Stop the madness, Lord. Just, just stop the madness that goes on there and, and the, the things that the children have to go through um, and see in their young lives, Father God. I just pray for all of them, and I pray that you will let me continue to work in their life as well as you. I, I thank you that you are working in their lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Lord. And I just give them all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. All right. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you for that opportunity. I appreciate it. It's, you know, we've been doing this prayer series, and the more time I spend trying to learn about prayer and reading what the Bible has to say about prayer, the more I recognize what a gift it is. That wherever we are, we can bear our heart to God and we can rest in his presence. Mm -hmm. There and, used uh, to be a book in the library, a couple of them on different prayers, but one of them was from the Apostle Paul yeah. and some of his prayers. We are going to be talking about something he said about prayer this week from Philippians chapter 4. To bring everything to God with prayer and exactly. Always, continuously. Yeah. yeah. So, he had some good things to say. Um, part of what uh, 
we're going to be sharing this coming Sunday is his command to bring everything to God, especially when we feel um, anxious or worried. That those are especially the things that we need to give over to God. Because they're, the way I've heard it said is, those things are God's job to handle, not ours. And when we hold on to them and try to handle them ourselves, that's when we get into trouble. Mm -hmm. We need to give them to God, the one who's right it is to take care of those things. And leave them there. Yeah, and not pick them back up again. Exactly. Exactly. Amen. We've even got more to come tonight. We're not even done yet. Uh, We're going to be continuing in our Bible study tonight. We've been going through the book of Ezekiel. And tonight we are going to be working on chapter 10. You'll catch up. It's a long, it's a long book. <laughs> this is true. What are we going to do for, for December? Well, we are going to continue talking about Ezekiel, but what we'll do is, in the beginning, we'll add a moment to go through um, the Advent devotion. So, I don't, for most weeks, I don't believe the Advent devotion will take our whole time. But we will be touching on Advent for Wednesday nights and Sunday nights. We'll touch on the Advent devotion as part of our opening, and then we'll do our further Bible study. So, it'll change our pace a little bit, but of course it's important that during that season... We focus on Jesus. Good question, though. Thank you. All right, so we are in Ezekiel chapter 10. Does anybody remember anything that has happened recently that we've been reading about in Ezekiel? So where we were in chapter 9, there was some pretty significant... I guess we'd say judgment going on. Um, Ezekiel was given another vision, and he saw seven men appear. Um, Seven of them were armed for battle, but one looked different than the others. Do you remember what the one who looked different looked like, or what he was carrying? Uh, Writing... Stuff. Yeah, a writing case. Yeah. yeah. So he's kind of the recorder or scribe, maybe you could say, of the bunch. Yeah. <coughs> he's going to come back up again in chapter 10. So in chapter 9, these six angels were sent out among the people to exact judgment on them. Now the people were marked, some people were marked to be spared. Do you remember what the difference was? Why those people were spared? They were the remnant, the faithful remnant. Yeah, and what behavior were they exhibiting that showed that? Mourning. They were mourning for their country, exactly. Their hearts were broken for what was happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to make sure we're all caught up, what had been going on was the the people of Israel, even the leaders, in this case the, the elders, had been worshiping idols. They'd been worshiping other gods. And not just worshiping them, they had been worshiping them in God's temple. They had taken part of God's temple and turned it over to worship other gods. <clears throat> and so they are now reaping the consequences of those choices. Um, one of the things they would say as they were worshiping is that God wouldn't see and he wouldn't care. And now they're learning that when God warned them not to do this, he meant it. And they faced the consequences. Um, where we were just finishing, um, I guess this is my weekly reminder that the chapter and verse markings were added later on. And so sometimes we have a, an idea, or in this case a vision, that carries from one chapter to the next, where the ideas continue. We started talking about um, the cherubim and the um, Ark of the Covenant, and that's where we're going to be picking up tonight in chapter 10. Just as a background there, um, does anybody remember what the Ark of the Covenant is? It's where it's got the Ten Commandments and it's got the budding staff of yeah. Aaron mm-hmm. and the cherubim have their wings like this. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the mercy seat is in the center and that's where the, the Spirit of God dwells. You nailed it, yeah. Um, in layman's terms, it was kind of like a big box, mm-hmm. right? And it had wooden rods that went through rings on the side so you could pick it up and carry it. 
Um, the Israelites were commanded through Moses to build it a certain way. God explained how to build it, and they carried it through the wilderness as they wandered for 40 years. Then eventually when the temple was built, it was brought into the temple. Um, and the lid of this chest had two angels, um, two golden angels on it that are called the cherubim. And they are, it's a rectangle box, and the angels are on either side facing each other with their wings outstretched. And they formed, what, like what Darlene said, it was called the mercy seat, which they believed that right above that spot where these angels' wings came together was where the Spirit of God dwelt in the temple. And this was kept in the very innermost part of the temple, what is sometimes called the Holy of Holies. Um, when we read in the New Testament of the story of Easter about the curtain being torn from the top to the bottom, this is what was behind the curtain. Okay? This was not an object that people could just approach. Um, not even all the priests were allowed to go there. Only the high priest was allowed to go there, and only at certain specific times. And wasn't it just of the Levi family? Yes. Yep. And not just Levites, but of the line of Aaron. Yeah. So there were several layers of qualification in order for you to do that. Yeah. So the reason I say that is because we're going to be talking about God and his glory and the cherubim tonight. And I want you to understand the context. So let's start Ezekiel chapter 10 here. Uh, do we have a volunteer who could read verses 1 through 5? You'd like to read? Okay. Nice and loud so we can all hear you, okay? I know you can do nice and loud. I looked and I saw the likeness of the thorough sapphire above the expanse that was over the head of the chair. And the Lord said to the man called and women, Go in among the wheels beneath the chair. Go your head and find gold among the chair and scatter them over the city. When they watched, he went in. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. I back and check. And the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim, and, and, uh, and moved to the control of the temple. The cloud filled the temple, and the court was filled with the radiance and glory of the Lord. The sound of the wings of the cherubim could be heard as, as far away as the outer court, like the voice of God Almighty in the sea. Thank you. So we have lots of details here, but what exactly is Ezekiel seeing? The cherubim came to life. Yeah, well, the chair, yeah, we have living cherubim, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like the, the still picture of the ark in the chest has now become a, a real life picture. And he can see the angels and see. Above the angels, what does he see? This is in verse 1. The brightness of the glory of the Lord. Yeah, the glory of the Lord and a, and a throne. And there's an important point here in other places in the Bible, like in the book of Revelation, when John gets to see the throne room of heaven, guess what the throne looks like? Same as here. Okay. So we have different people at different times having visions of the throne of God, God's heavenly throne, and it looks like blue, a blue crystal, a blue precious stone. Some translations say sapphire, yeah. some translations say lapis lazuli. Yeah, but it would be a, like a blue gemstone. Okay. So this, I want to be clear, this is not it's not that there was a blue throne in the temple on earth. We're seeing God's heavenly throne. So Ezekiel's kind of seeing this blending of what's happening, the supernatural heavenly throne and the earthly temple. It's kind of like he's seeing through the veil and getting a bigger picture of things that are hidden from most people. Okay? So as he looks... The, the man with him, the, the, the one with the linen clothing and the writer's case, tells Ezekiel to go up to the angels and reach underneath. Remember his vision way back in chapter 1? What did he see beneath the angels? The wheels. Yeah, the wheel within a wheel, the whirling wheels. And there were fires, or coals, burning coals. 
And so he tells Ezekiel to reach in and grab some of those coals. And what is he supposed to do with them? Scatter them over the city. Scatter them over the city. Yeah. Now, um, we've got to ask this question. When, when we have a symbolic act like this, what does it mean? Um, we have the question of what might it mean to you and I today, but also in that context, in that culture, what would it have meant to them? So if I were to tell you, Darlene, grab some burning wood and throw it in your neighbor's backyard. <laughs> what, what would that mean? Like, what would that represent? That Good burning, things, bad things? My hand would get burned. Well, your hand would get burned, okay. Set their house on fire. Set their house on fire. House yeah. House. Is that a good thing? Setting your neighbor's house on fire? Generally, no. That's not something we want to do. So, you know, scatter these burning coals across the city. It's like set the, set the city on fire. Yeah. Now, sometimes those burning coals represent um, a holy purity. <clears throat> the difference is those coals are usually specifically taken from the altar. So when Isaiah has his vision, and he says he's unworthy, mm -hmm. and the angel takes a coal and touches his lips, it's not just any coal, it's a coal from the altar. So we have the idea of what does fire mean. Well, it can mean purification, but it can also mean destruction. Um, in this case, it sounds like we're saying, set the city on fire. Grab these coals from the angel and spread this holy fire over the whole city as part of the destruction and punishment of the city. Now, is this just a symbolic act for what's happening in Jerusalem? No, they act, the city actually gets burned. So when, when Babylon conquers Jerusalem, they knock down the walls, they knock down the temple, and they set everything on fire. So this is something that actually happens. This, this isn't just a symbolic fire. This is what happens in reality as well. So we're seeing the angelic side, the holy vision side, but it's directly translating to what's happening you know, in Jerusalem in the temple. And so that's the next thing. As he sees this throne in the cherubim, um, what happens to the glory of the Lord in verse 4? Rises up. Rises up from over the cherubim, you know, where he's, his place he lives inside the temple. In which direction does it go? Yeah. Once it moves out, it says that the temple was filled with something. What was the temple filled with? The glory of the Lord. Yeah, like smoke. The glory of the Lord, like smoke. Um, or a cloud. Does that ring a bell? Have you ever heard anything like that happen? Or in the Exodus. Exactly. When they first built the tabernacle, where the Ark of the Covenant was housed, at that point it was like a tent that could move from place to place. It wasn't a building. When God first came down and, and indwelled the temple, this is what Moses saw. Mm -hmm. That God's glory came down from heaven, and the, the tabernacle was filled with this cloud of God's presence, and people couldn't even go in. Here's the difference. In the story of the Exodus, which direction is God's presence going? In or out? In. Yeah. Right? In the Exodus, God's presence is coming into the tabernacle, right? Filling it, indwelling it. In this case, in Ezekiel's vision, which direction is God's glory going? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He goes from the inner down to the doorway. Mm -hmm. He hasn't left the temple yet, but he's going the other direction. What do you think that might symbolize for Israel and the temple? He's turning his back on them. Mm. So, yeah. this is a little bit of a gory detail, but it's important to understand. When these other um, beings were told to kill, do you remember what they were told to do with the dead bodies? Throw them around in the temple. Bring them to the temple. Throw them in the temple to That's defile the temple. Yes. And what does it mean when a temple is defiled? It's no longer holy. It can no longer be used for worship. So God has told these beings to collect the bodies and defile the temple. And while that's going on, Ezekiel sees the glory of the Lord manifest itself physically as a cloud. But instead of coming in and filling the temple, it's coming out of the temple. So Ezekiel is seeing a physical representation of God's glory 
leaving the temple as these beings carry out their command to defile it. And because, I mean, honestly, was it already defiled? Mm. Yeah, remember when Ezekiel, earlier in the vision, when he peeks through the hole in the wall and he sees everybody worshiping the idol? See, the temple had already been defiled by the elders. They had defiled it when they worshiped other gods and brought in idols and did these secret rituals. The worst part was that there was a war of beasts for the high priest. Some of them, yeah. Not, not all of them, but some of them. And of course, the elders of Israel, the people who were supposed to be the leaders. In our church language, they were the ones who were supposed to be making the disciples. But instead of discipling people to worship God, mm-hmm. they were discipling people to worship these other idols. And they're the ones who receive God's wrath first. When these beings are sent out to, to, to kill those who are not marked, the, el- the elders of Israel are the ones who they go to first. The leaders who led the people astray. Okay, so we've seen the beginning of this amazing vision. Can somebody now read verses 6 through 14? We'll see what happens next. <clears throat> when he commanded the man clothed in linen, take fire from within the wheelwork from among the cherubim, he went in and stood beside a wheel. And a cherub stretched out his hand from among the cherubim to the fire that was among the cherubim, took some of it and put it into the hands of the man clothed in linen, who took it and went out. The cherubim appeared to have the form of a human hand under their wings. They looked and there were four wheels beside the cherubim, one beside each cherub, and the appearance of the wheel wheels was like gleaming barrel. And as for their appearance, the four looked alike, something like a wheel within a wheel. When they moved, they moved in any of the four directions without veering as they moved. But in whatever direction the front wheel faced, the others followed without veering as they moved. Their entire body, their rims, their spokes, their wheels, their wings, and the wheels, the wheels of the four of them were full of eyes all around. As for the wheels, they were called in my hearing, the wheel work. Each one had four faces. The first face was that of a cherub. The second face was that of a human, human being. The third, that of a lion. And the fourth, that of an eagle. Thank you, darling. So we have a little bit of repetition in this section. And I want to touch on this because... We want to mention a little bit about Hebrew, okay? Um, in Hebrew, even in, in Hebrew poetry or in Hebrew wisdom writings, what do you think it meant when something was repeated? It's important. Yeah, God is my rock, my shield, and my deliverer, my fortress and my strength. It's kind of five ways of saying the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. Why would God say the same thing five different ways? Why do you tell your kids to pick up their clothes off the bathroom floor 18 times? So to get the message across. To get the message across, exactly. Because we're not always that good at listening. Yeah. So when an idea is repeated in Hebrew, you know, like in, in English poetry, a lot of times you would repeat a sound, right? Um, you know, like Shakespeare kind of thing, um, where you might have a, a, a syllable that's repeated in a certain pattern. Well, in Hebrew poetry, it wasn't, sometimes it would be a letter or a sound, but often and usually it was an idea that was repeated. Um, so if an idea is repeated more than once, it's really important, that's what we're trying to get across. So a second time, we have this command about the coals, right? To grab the coals from the wheels beneath the angels. Something a little bit different happens this time, though. Um, the first time, the command was to reach your hands in and take the coals, right? What happens this time? The cherubim give it to him. Yeah, the angels take out the coals and hand it out. Their faces were different this time, too. Yeah, the, one, the first word is a little bit different. It's, it's a different word than was used back in chapter 1. Um, some version, that, that word, uh, one had the face of a cherub, the first word there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, in chapter 1, verse 10, that word is translated, a different word is used that is the explicit word for ox, mm-hmm. so the face of an ox. 
In this case, a different word is used. Some English translations go ahead and translate that as ox because it matches with the pattern before. But because it's a different word and it's unusual, mm -hmm. some just say the face of a cherub because it's one of the faces that the cherub has. So you, you might have different Bible translations might say that differently. Yours said face of a cherub. Mine says ox, but then has a note about that other word. So this is one of those cases where sometimes it's a little tricky to translate a word, and so we look at context. Um, besides that one word being different, how does this vision compare to Ezekiel's first vision? Are they the same or different? Same. Mm -hmm. We have the cherub, the cherubim, oh, oh, here's the other point, cherub and cherubim. Cherubim is just the plural for cherub. So one cherub did something, but there were four cherubim, okay? <clears throat> that I am is the plural. So like the angels who came down and, and, and had children with men and created the giants are called the Nephilim, mm -hmm. right? So the, that I am just is the plural. It means there's more than one. <clears throat> so Ezekiel sees the same vision he had of heaven before, he sees happening. Now, this is a little bit of a callback, so you might not remember this detail. Don't feel bad if you don't. But his first vision of heaven, when he saw all these angels and the wheels, it ended with him seeing something happening, something coming towards him. Remember? Storm. A storm. Yes. Yeah, good memory. It, it culminated in them coming like a storm. <laughs> what has happened now? Storms here. Coals are coming out of the wheels and being spread across the city. Yeah. So the coming storm that Ezekiel saw is now arrived in Jerusalem. <coughs> All right, let's continue here. Um, and this is the end of the chapter. It's a, a relatively short chapter. Um, can somebody finish out chapter 10 by reading verses 15 to 22, please? Thank you. Then the cherubim rose upward. These were the living creatures I had seen by the Kabar River. When the cherubim moved, the wheels beside them moved. And when the cherubim spread their wings to rise from the ground, the wheels did not leave their side. When the cherubim stood still, they also stood still. And when the cherubim rose, they rose with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the, of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. While I watched the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground, and as they went, the wheels went with them. They stopped at the entrance to the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. These were the living creatures I had seen beneath the God of Israel by the Kabar River, and I realized that they were cherubim. Each had four faces and four wings, and under their wings was what looked like the hands of a man. Their faces had the same appearance as those I had seen by the Kabar River. Each one went straight ahead. Thank you. So Ezekiel's very clear here. Is, this, is he just seeing something that's like what he saw before? Do these angels just look like the angels he saw before? No. Annika's shaking her head now. What does he say? What did he say, Annika? So they're the same ones, right? The same ones he saw by the river. Now, that vision by the Kabar River, let's have a little geography note. Where was the Kabar River? What country? Babylon. Babylon, yeah. So remember, in this vision, God picked up Ezekiel by the head and brought him to Israel. So when he was in Babylon and he had the vision of the coming storm, it was these very same beings. Now that he's in Jerusalem, as God took him in spirit, brought him over, the spirit of God brought him, he's seeing the same angels that arrive in Jerusalem. Just like we have a statue of the cherubim with their outstretched wings on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, we see the actual cherubim there with the presence of God above. Now, where we were before, he moved out from the innermost part of the temple towards the entrance to the temple. Now where has he moved? <coughs> There was a very specific word Joe read. The spirit did what? What was his movement described as? It took 
departed. It departed, yes. <laughs> His spirit departed. What does it mean to depart a place? Leave. To leave. Yes. So it come, comes out from the innermost part of the temple. We see it at the entrance. Now we're over to the gate, which is the outside edge of the, the wall of the temple, right? The east gate. So God's holy presence is bodily leaving the temple. That's what the cloud is? <clears throat> yeah, it represents the spirit or the presence of the Lord. And it's like he's abandoning that place. Yeah, during the Exodus, the cloud was there by day and the fire by night. And that was, they were both... And they followed it, yeah. Yeah. So we've got the physical reality of the war and the famine and the swords and all those things. But spiritually... What does this chapter mean for Israel? They're on their own. They're on their own, yeah. They're doomed. Uh, I think a way we could say it in a, a modern phrase would be, you made your bed, now you have to lay in it. Hasta la vista, baby. What was that? Hasta la vista, baby. Yeah, yeah, see you later. Exactly. You know, they had decided that rather than trust in God, they were going to trust in these pagan idols. I wonder how close we are to getting to that point. Well, there we go. That's the next question to ask. Right? Fair enough. This, this vision was given to Ezekiel, and it was there spoken to the people of Israel, but it was also included in the Bible for us today. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we see in this story is that the people who were entrusted as the teachers of the truth didn't do their job and led the people astray. And because of that, it brought death and destruction upon the people. Now for me, what I hear, especially when we combine it with what we mentioned about Ezekiel's call to be a watchman and speak the word of warning, well, that's us, right? We're supposed to be speaking the word of warning. If you don't repent, there will be eternal consequences. Right? And there is a God who loves you, and he wants to forgive you. But you're going to ask, and you have to change. You can't just keep doing what you're doing. That's the key part of repentance, right? It's not just being sorry that you got caught or being sorry that you have the consequences. Repenting is, I'm sorry and I'm going to change. The literal translation, I may have heard me say this, but I've got to say it because it means a lot. It means to turn around and go the other direction, right? It's like when you're on your GPS in the car and you first miss the turn, and you miss the right turn, it tells you to take the next right turn. But if you keep going too far, eventually the GPS says, no, you got to pull the U-turn and go back the other way. Right? That's what this is. Right? The Holy Spirit gives us our small course corrections. But sometimes we reach a point where we've gone so far from God's will, we've got to turn around and go back. And that's repenting. Right? I've sinned, and I need to turn around and go back. I need to go the other direction from what I've been doing. Um, I try not to be too political in these Bible studies, and I'm not going to mention parties or politics or anything. What I am going to say is, it's clear to me that our country is in a broken place. Mm -hmm. right? That there is division and fighting in a way that there has not been for a very long time. And maybe this is different than it ever has been. Um, people, don't, people don't value human life anymore. Aside from the political whatever stuff that's happening, just in general, I mean, every day you turn on the news and somebody got murdered. Every day. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the, the problem, yeah. is it's becoming commonplace. And it hardens people's hearts. Even more, yeah. Yeah. It's not shocking anymore. The sin right. has become commonplace. Right. And you know what? That's exactly how the situation is described for Israel. That worshiping these idols and doing these bad things was so common that everybody just accepted it as something that happens. And we're getting to such a backwards place that sin is becoming so common that it's completely accepted. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't make it right. It, it makes it even all the more deadly. Right. right? Because people play with it like it's something fun. You know, I remember having a conversation with Josiah probably about a year ago at this point where he was asking about what Ouija boards were mm. and we talked about it. 
And you know what he said after our conversation? Why do they sell them at Toys R Us? Because you know, people use them. That's a good one. They're in the toy section, darling. I know. Yeah. Talk to a demon. Yeah, have fun with your friends. Yeah. I mean, uh, years and years ago, and that thing moved, I said, oh, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That thing moved on its own. Right. So, yeah, so but you know that's what I went to the Outlet a few days ago? Yes. So, actually, in the in like a oh, super big memory store that I mean puzzles and yeah. stuff, there were there was like an entire aisle that was just had like five or six Ouija boards right there. Yeah. It's like have fun with your friends, talk to some news. It's like that's not people have no fear of demonic stuff. And it's it's they even deeper it's than that, even fundamental things like like honoring life, like not killing each other. I know, if you, you, they hit people with their car and they just keep on going, I, you know, I hit a buzzard a couple months ago, I mean, I looked in my rear view and he flew away, but I was highly upset. I don't even like killing a mouse in a mouse trap. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll step on a car bridge, but mine's not that. Anyway, <laughs> what I mean is, our, our country has, is moving in this direction, and I think most people probably agree. Here's the thing, though. Christians are becoming less and less different from our society. Right? People who, to use common modern language, self-identify as Christians are living in ways that are really no different than anybody else. And that's what these elders of the church did, right? They, they picked up the habits of the other people who did not worship God, and they started doing it just like everybody else, and that's how they got into all the trouble. So I'm going to say, let's take a moment and stop thinking about people who aren't Christians and let's think about ourselves. Are we following God in such a way that we honor him by our choices? Trying our best. I mean, Jesus said that the world will hate us because we're different. Paul says the same things in his letters too, like when he writes to Timothy. But is that true? Do I stand out enough that I don't fit in with the world? You know, the way I spend my time, the way I spend my money, the kind of entertainment I consume, the way I treat my neighbors, right? The way we, were, we were out the other day. We went to a food truck festival by our house. We walked over. And I felt led, the, the, some of the city workers were out collecting the garbage. And one of the guys was right next to us. He was taking the trash bag out of the can. And I just felt like God was saying, say thank you. So I went up to the guy and I just said, thank you. And he was so shocked, you'd think I hit him with a water balloon. <laughs> right? Something as simple as just saying thank you. Right? I'm, not, I'm not trying to brag, I'm just saying common decency is so uncommon that it stands out. It's like earlier when I was in the store and I could tell she was visibly upset and mm -hmm. told her we would pray for her. Yeah. So we'll toot your horn for a second. That's what we're called to do, right? When you see somebody hurting, you pray, you talk to them, you reach out. And it doesn't always, you know, you, who knows where it's going to go or what's going to happen. Right. Well, we I mean, talk. I see her frequently. I can go ahead and keep on with the conversation. There you go. There you go. So, so it's I'm important not to squelch the Holy Spirit when he speaks to you. Yeah. Right? And that that's what you didn't do by say, just by saying thank you. Mm -hmm. I think so. I don't think that was my idea because I don't generally like talking to people I don't know. <laughs> um, my wife's <laughs> laughter confirms that I'm telling the truth. Um, and yet you're the pastor of a church. God has a sense of humor, darling. Oh, I know that. Guess who <laughs> hates standing up in front of people? Yeah. But we do where God, we do where God leads us, right? So I'm not trying to beat you over the head with anything. I'm just saying this story in Ezekiel warns us of what happens when the church stops being the church, when we stop being salt and light. In Jesus' own words, what good is salt that has lost its saltiness? Right. It's not good for anything. No. Throw it in the garbage. Right. I don't want to lose my saltiness, and I don't want us to lose our saltiness as a church. And there's always this question, especially this year with COVID and all the restrictions. Well, 
we may feel salty with each other in here, but if we were to ask random people in the town whether this church is salty or not, what would they say? People are watching, and every weekend I have people watching my behavior. Yeah. So I think there are some ways where people definitely see us being salty. I think the food pantry is one of those ways. Oh, yeah, big time. That people in yeah. town know they can come here and get some help. God has help blessed that because. tremendously. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that means we should rest. Just because we're doing that good thing doesn't mean we should rest. Right? We build on that. We grow. So, just want to. I want you to hear me. I'm not speaking this as a word of condemnation. I want it to be spoken as a word of encouragement. We are warned what will happen if we go the other direction. So let's go this way. Right? Let's not forget who we're called to be and how we're called to love the world, our neighbor. And you remember when Jesus was asked who's our neighbor, he said it's the one who has a need. Right? The one who has a need. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody or everybody. That's why we're talking about all these ministry opportunities all the time. Like with the breakfast mission and the food pantry and the missionaries. And none, of, none of us is going to be called to serve or help out in all those areas. But we want everybody to hear all these opportunities so you can find the place where God is leading you. You know? Jill's going to be helping out on Sunday night with the kids. I'm not. Because I want to clump their little heads together like coconuts. <laughs> yes, thank, thank, so thank you, Jill. Thank, I thank stay you with you. the grown-ups, <laughs> and Jill sings songs with the little kids. Because parents generally don't like it when you clump their kids' heads together like coconuts. <laughs> <laughs> We're gifted differently, right? We're, that's a way I could say it, right? We are very differently gifted. That's right. <laughs> but we got to find where God wants us to go and thrive. All right, well, before we get into a sermon, I think that's going to close this up. Um, before we finish, does anyone have anything you'd like to say about what we read or anything we prayed about tonight? I have a sort of semi-question type thing. Sure. Okay, we're talking about the, the Ark of the Covenant, and I know that it disappeared at some point in time. <laughs> so, a very simple question, right? First of all, it might be on Oak Island, but that's your <laughs> <laughs> It's in a warehouse. <laughs> yeah. I saw that on TV. It's yeah, the they're, they're stuck there from the night. <laughs> so yeah, asking me. In Revelation 11, verse 19, it's there. It's in, it's in heaven. It's in the throne room of God in yeah. heaven. So, here's what we know. We know that before Babylon conquered, it was in the temple in Jerusalem. Right. The temple gets destroyed. And we don't really have any confirmed public sightings after that. Right. We know that it shows up in the throne room of heaven in Revelation. So, I don't think God did a bait and switch. Right? So, my understanding is he took it back. Yeah. It was his, and he took it back. Now, there are lots of rumors about what places it might be today. There are stories about the Knights Templar finding it. There are people who think that, you know, recently there have been some archaeological studies of the Temple Mount. So even though the temple was destroyed, the very base of foundation stayed. Right. And that's still there today. Even though there's a Muslim mosque built on top of it, the, the Western Wall, which is often called the Wailing Wall, you, You've probably seen pictures of people leaning against the wall and praying or writing prayers down on little pieces of paper and stuffing it in the cracks. That's the original foundation of Solomon's temple. Well, if they use ground penetrating radar and they can see that there's a hollow space behind it, the room. Some people think it's there. There is a Coptic church in Ethiopia that claims to have it. That, there that was some guy a few years back, I think he passed on since the archaeologist and he found it somewhere over in, in Yeah, Israel. um there are some people who claim it's on a mountain in Turkey. No, that's the Ark. Well now there's the now there's yeah, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant might be over there too. Yeah. Lots yeah. of people have claimed lots of things. Yeah. Well here's the thing, they have count they can't block down that much wall because that would completely destroy that would completely or straw well, it would destroy the temple above it, and I right. don't think the Muslim people who worship there want that. No, 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 no. So, they don't like us anyway. So, so 
I, look, I'm a trivia guy. I like asking these questions and so clearly. I mean, I've read about this. That's why I know these things. But part of what I'm also asking myself is, why did God send the ark? And what purpose would it serve for us today other than a magic trick? Because if well, we mentioned this earlier. What happened when Jesus died? The day Jesus died, what happened? The, the curtain was torn. Right. And so what do you think that symbolized when that curtain was torn? First of all, top to bottom, so we know God did it. But what was that supposed to symbolize when the curtain was that torn? That we can approach this room. Yeah. We don't have to go to a gold-plated box right. we go through in the Jesus. Middle East. Right. We've got the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And I'm not saying that's not a special place. We have Jesus as the intercessor. Exactly. So Jesus died and didn't leave us as orphans and sent the Holy Spirit to us as prophesied in Joel. So we don't have to have that anymore. We don't have to have a temple where I've got to go to that place to worship. Right. Because Just God's like, Spirit was poured out on the whole world. And no, most people couldn't touch it. I mean, if it, if it was what it was, no one else could touch it other than the, the line of Aaron. Yeah. So Venus makes an interesting point. She said, if we had the ark, it would show some people that they can have faith that the Bible is true. They've already, they're, they're, I love it when archaeology proves that the Bible is true. I mean, not that I don't believe, but that's just cool. Oh, I do too. You know. You know, the way the people are described, so when prophets would speak, and this is, this is repeated in Revelation, they say, if you have eyes, you should see, and if you have ears, you should hear. And you know how the people of Israel are often described? Not. People who have eyes but don't see and right. ears but don't hear. You know? If they didn't believe in Jesus, are they going to believe that? Right. A, a friend of mine who's a pastor was speaking the other day. He was having lunch with somebody. And the guy sat down. He, he'd been attending the church. And he said, Pastor, i got to ask you a question. Do I have to believe the Bible, everything in the Bible to be a Christian? And the pastor asked, well, what do you mean? He said, do I have to believe that Jonah actually got swallowed by a big fish? <laughs> and you know what the pastor said? Oh, you've got to believe something way crazier than that. Exactly. You've got to believe that the Son of God died and rose from the dead three days later to save exactly. us. Yeah, so if you believe that, mm -hmm. I mean, the fish thing's not, not that big a deal, right? right? I mean, it is, but you know what I mean. Well, Indiana Jones might be able to tell us where the ark is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That in the cup and yeah. oh, wait a minute. Some people got they got their feet snorted. Well that's true. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> no one can touch the ark other than the the descendants of Aaron. So it's an interesting question. I'm gonna say that as far as I can tell, there's no yeah. good answer. It was there, it's not there. You know, when when items were taken from the temple in Babylon, they're listed. When Ezra and Nehemiah bring items back. It even says like how many bowls and how many right. cups and right. which were silver and which were gold. The ark is not mentioned. Right. Later on, in 70 AD, when the temple is destroyed by the Roman Empire, they take everything out and bring it to Rome, and they have a big list of all the items that they brought. The ark is not listed there either. Right. So I feel like if either of those people had the ark, they would have been bragging about it. Oh, yeah. Because that would have been a big old trophy. If Nebuchadnezzar had the ark sitting on his coffee table, people would have known, <laughs> right? Right. So, mostly because of the face melting, I think. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. yeah. Or the tumors, that's why. But it was take the know, place of his in coffee the, table. Yeah, there we go. In the book of Revelation, it's like, it's purposefully mentioned. Yeah. When the door to heaven opens, there's the ark of the covenant. And part of how I understand that, and this is my opinion, okay? The Bible doesn't say this. This is my opinion. So when the ark was taken by the Philistines and it's coming back, there's a time when the cart that it's on starts to rock and the ark starts to tip. And a guy reaches up to grab it to keep it from tipping over and he dies. Right. right. And part of the message I hear there is the ark is God's and he'll take care of it. Exactly. And that's what I hear in Revelation. We did not do a very good job of taking care of the ark as human beings. So God, he took care of it. Because it's not our life. Well, that guy was trying to help it, but again, it's... But again, this is on my list of things to ask when we get to heaven. <laughs> so. All will be revealed. Because oh, yeah. right now we see us in a mirror darkly. <laughs> yeah. 
So on that note, let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you for another night together. Thank you for a time to pray, to come together and anoint. Father, we thank you for your promise and your word in Psalm 91 that when your people cry out to you, you will hear. And Father, we lean on that promise tonight physically as we anoint it as we pray. We lift up our brothers and sisters tonight who we prayed for. We especially pray for Jim and for Edgar as they have surgeries coming up, Father. Um, thank you that as we face these trials, we don't have to face them alone. And thank you for this word tonight, Father. Thank you for the warnings we read from your prophet Ezekiel. And please, Father, help us to not go down that path. Help us to learn from these warnings, to learn from your word, and to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, thank you. Facebook, Venus, you had a really good answer to that. I love your question. Um, that ark is a good... This is this came comes up in men's Bible study, too. When we read about the ark in Jerusalem, and it came up that... Well, wait, well, where's the ark now? I don't know. <laughs> I can't even find my socks. That's true. Well, the ark is coming.